Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of In the Spotlight. I'm Mike Kenichi. I'm really excited tonight because if you were a fan of the 80s, 90s, you've seen this woman and everything. Who could forget her performance in Falcon Crest, the new Gidget, um, Star Trek, uh, Uncle Buck. I mean, so many new heart. I mean, so many things she was in. And I mean, she's a credit to the industry. She's done it all. It is my privilege to introduce to you Miss Jill Jacobson and Jill thank you thank you for coming on today it's a real honor for me thank you Mike this is sweet so Jill um you mm -hmm. you grew up in um Belmar Texas correct Belmont uh, Belmont. Belmont yep yep so <laughs> talk about that a little bit um you know because I mean uh how did your journey to acting really begin well I was very shy and I love movies. <laughs> Come on, you know. I mean, it's like when you're a little girl and you, you're you watching, everything's just so big. And my life was so, like, dull and negative in Beaumont. Um, and here I am. I remember vividly South Pacific. I remember the intermission. Remember the intermissions in those movies? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it was like, we don't have any of that anymore. Um, West Side Story affected me in such a big way. Um, it was my escape. It was everything in the world to me. So my major was film. I was so happy being a film major, studying everything there was about film. Um, and then I kind of, after my graduation from college, I couldn't wait to come out here and be part of it. And I was so fortunate to be able to come out and immediately be part of it. It was shocking. I had no... I had no connections. I had no relatives. I had, you know, somebody um, from UT, University of Texas in Austin, somebody gave me the phone numbers of two grisly sort of Texas actors, character actors, and they always worked. I mean, the grisly character actors always worked in these grisly Texas movies. And I met these two men, and I was just a little baby girl. And they said, oh, I want to introduce you to this guy. I want to introduce you to this guy. And they introduced me to two writer-producers. And um, I booked both movies, and away we go, you know. Um, one was Nursery. Yeah, Jerry, which became a cult film, and one was Bad Georgia Road. Georgia Road, yeah, yeah, great movie. Um, really, the, you think so? I I do. But <laughs> the thing is, um, you know what's interesting though, Jill, is uh, you know, I ask a lot of actors this, and it's kind of surprising to me because you would think like the love would come from their parents, but. So many of them, their parents weren't actors. Like, I think your father was a doctor, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, mm -hmm. he actually passed away when you were like 11 or 12, correct? Yeah, so, good memory. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, like, in a lot of ways, you you didn't really have like an in to get into it. You just had that's to really it. work hard and go to school and things like that. So, I mean, that's really a, a remarkable thing because, I mean, it's not an easy business to get into. And I always say this, sometimes people... You know, the, the media will measure success by the amount of stardom the person has. But I look at it this way, that you've been working for over 40 years. And to me, that right there shows that you're a success. <laughs> yes, I've been working a long time and I I can't give it up. I can't stop, you know. And then I, I kind of finagled into um, stand-up comedy somebody in one of my classes said, you know, you're funny. And I said, I, I am. And they said, yeah, you're really funny. And if you take a stand up class, I'll book you immediately. Right. And, and they did. I mean, immediately. And uh, you don't make any money doing that. But boy, it is. It's riveting. It's yeah. riveting to be in front of an, an 
entire audience telling jokes. That's like, whoa, I didn't know I had that in me. I mean, I, and now I think we need it more than ever because yeah, the definitely. world is, the world needs funny. I oh, think we need funny laughter. badly. Yeah. yeah. And Jill, um, what's, what's interesting about you as well is I think you've done theater, but you never really had the love for theater. It was always film. I love theater. Right. But I don't think like, um, where a lot of people love the theater first, you loved films more. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Which a lot of, that's the opposite for a lot of people I've interviewed. They love the theater more. Yeah. Even though they might have more success in films. They definitely love the theater more. But um, to me, Jill, that that's the hardest thing about being an actress is when you have to perform up there live. I mean, you know, it's one thing to record and they could edit stuff and you could kind of mess up and they could keep doing retakes. Yeah. You do theater. There's no, you know, I guess it's true what they say, though. You can't mess up when it's live, but still, no. it's not easy to do. Well, you know, people don't know that I was winning awards in these parts. Like Clifford Odette's, I um, I was studying, at that time, I was studying with Milton Casales. And I'm, I know you know all these people, right, Mike? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. You, I mean, you can't do this without knowing them, for right. sure. Right. Yeah. So my first big teacher was Peggy Fury. Right. That's another story altogether. Um, but then at that, at my second big teacher was Milton because Peggy died. And um, anyway, so Milton taught me something that most teachers never teach an actor, which is you got to produce. Yeah. And uh, so many young actors don't realize. Well, actually, they do now. I think they do more than they did then. But um, so I did a I did a scene from Clifford Odette's Rocket to the Moon, which is exquisite play. Just so beautiful. Um, Milton told me to read the play. I did a scene from him for he he wanted me to do Butterflies Are Free, which, of course, he directed the film with Goldie Hawn. Right. And I did, I did butterflies are free in class, and I, they gave me like a. He loved it, he loved it, and he said, "I think you should take a look at Rocket to the Moon." And um, that night, I did whatever he said to do, you know, and um, that night I read Rocket to the Moon, and cried my eyes out, and I thought it was the most beautiful play I had ever read, and immediately set forth to. Um, getting someone from the class to do Dr. Stark with me while I was doing Cleo Singer. And we worked on it, worked on it, and um, did it in class. And Milton said, I think you should produce this play. And I said, I was very feisty then. I, I guess I'm kind of feisty now, but I was kind of feisty and I just said, will you help me produce it? So he was kind of stuck and he turned to his protégés that helped him produce from Skylight. And uh, they said, we've got to help her produce Rocket to the Moon. And so they initially helped me. And then I moved it to another theater and we won, we won six drama log awards. Wow. And um, I mean, talk about crying my eyes out. First time I was producing and playing the lead in a play. And I mean, I was kind of a baby, you know, and and then you get up on stage when they're giving out the awards and then they say, no, no, you can't leave now. You've got another award coming. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And you just start <laughs> crying, 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 because it's like this is my first time doing something like this and then it just I got the bug and I did um Summer and Smoke Tennessee Williams and that one best production of the year and um Death of a Salesman and no I don't get me wrong I really love theater and I love winning awards I just wish people recognized it the way they do in New York they don't here yeah, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, New York seems to always be 
<clears throat> you know, the measuring stick for so yes. many things. I mean, it really does. And I mean, especially Broadway, it definitely does. But um, I just, you are right in the sense that they don't recognize it in other parts of the world. And it's really a shame because, I mean, there is nothing like going to see a Broadway play. I mean, it is something magical. Well, I mean, just think of how easy they've got it. I mean, the actors have it easy. They, they, they get a paycheck. Uh, everything's done for them. When you do it here in L.A., it's kind of like makeshift. You have to come up with all your own stuff. And when I was producing it, it was like, uh, how do we do this? You know, what do we do? I have So I fed everybody. That was my payment at that time was, let me feed you. Yeah. Um, and it worked. And But the actors that I had were magnificent. They were so brilliant. Randy Elglesby was my leading man in Rocket to the Moon. You, you can't get better than that. Um, Scott Lincoln was my leading man in Summer and Smoke. You don't no, get better no. than that. And um, And the people that saw it loved it. I mean, they loved it. But it wasn't New York. No. Um, one of the things, too, Jill, that uh, I learned, you know, over the years just by uh, watching you in different interviews or reading stuff is you I was never aware of this. But interestingly, when uh, you would apply for an acting school or to take an acting class, you thought it was really hard. But when you get right down to it, they will take <laughs> anybody because they want people in the class. So, like, that's something that I never thought of. I thought it was really hard to get into an acting class, but for the most part, they'll take anybody because they really want the people. I thought that too. I thought that, you know, I, when I was at UT and I sent, um, um, oh, it was, um, cat on a hot tin roof. I did, I had done a scene because, you know, I was in the film department. So I did a scene from cat on a hot tin roof and, um, sent it to film actors workshop, I believe. And uh, when I got accepted, I was just like, <laughs> I mean, it, and then I realized, oh gosh, everybody gets accepted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, you know what? That's no matter what this scenario is, the situation. I mean, if whether everybody gets accepted or not, I mean you get that opportunity and you have to make the most of it. And I know like talking to different uh, actors, I know uh, Al Sepienza told me that when he was in an acting class, if they caught you yawning, the te the instructor would throw you no. right out of there. So, yeah. I mean, you got to make sure that they, they want to make sure that you're really serious about doing this. If they feel like you're wasting their time, they'll just throw you out of there. Well, I mean, Milton Casales was, that was the guy that would throw you out, you know, um, Peggy, Okay, so Peggy Fury was one of the, well, she was the premier teacher in Los Angeles. Um, Peggy had narcolepsy. Yeah. So you couldn't really fault yourself for falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you would be doing, and everybody in class would be doing this amazing work. I mean, they were all young movie stars. I mean, Sean Penn was in my class, Jeff Goldblum, Annette O'Toole, Bruno Kirby, uh, Angelica Houston, Lily Tomlin. I mean, you, you, Nicolas Cage, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and they've all made it in the business. So that says yeah. a lot about the acting. Teacher. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, and they were... We were all little babies. I mean, we were all like little, Sean was an adorable little baby. Um, and this is before anything, anybody really made it. Jeff Goldblum was actually on the cusp of already making it, but um, Sean wasn't. Um, anyway, so you would be doing a scene that was, or watching a scene in class that was, brilliant i mean really brilliant and you turn and you'd look at peggy and she'd be like <laughs> yeah yeah and then the scene would be over and she would critique the scene perfectly yeah. i mean absolutely perfectly and you're like how did she do that 
how does somebody with narcolepsy teach so brilliantly? But that was Peggy, and anybody that was in class at that time with Peggy would attest to her genius. And she was a genius. I mean, imagine the people in class. Yeah. Imagine what I was privy to. It was just, and what I was able to do in the class. Right. I mean, you know, I mention a couple of these playwrights to people, and they go, who? You know? I mean, it, it, what a great way to grow up in the business. And I don't know who's doing it now. I don't know what. I mean, Peggy was an actor. But I don't know. Um, and I mean, I started teaching as well. But it just seems that it's so much better to have an acting coach that was an actor than yeah. someone that doesn't understand. And Peggy really understood everything uh they're both dead now yeah and jill um it, the old saying is true just when you think you've learned everything you haven't learned enough and you could right. always, you could always keep learning and i can recall that when um you started working at falcon crest there was a woman by the name of marie carter and she really taught you about how to look on camera how to hold your gown wow. so i mean she was really instrumental in helping you along the way so I mean, never mind the fact that you got notoriety being on a successful show by like Falcon Crest, but you also got to learn more about the business. From and, my makeup artist. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty impressive. And Marie, Marie, um, I mean, she was the one that demanded that they give me a minimum of an hour for makeup. <laughs> she <laughs> demanded it, you know, and uh, I just, and, I mean, yes, Marie taught me things, but I worked with Jane Wyman, number one. Oh, yeah. My yeah. first year on the show. And the second year I was on the show, David Selby. Come yeah. on. How much better can you get? And there were certain things, if I recall, though, that uh, Jane didn't like that they were doing with your character at times, but it worked. So, I mean. We can talk about it now, can't we? Sure, but okay. um, yeah, but there I do know that uh, she didn't always she she was great to work with in the sense you learned a lot. But Amazing, like, she, yeah. But she basically, you know, she had an idea of how things should be, and there were times she felt like, no, don't put that in her her uh, script or whatever it might be. Good memory, she, Mike. She didn't always. Uh, she wasn't always crazy about the writing. Jane Wyman was married to Ronald Reagan. Yeah, yeah. Jane Wyman was a conservative. So when the producers of the show decided that it would be very, very good for my character, because my character was pretty wild. Miss Jones was very wild yeah, character. Yeah. And the producers of the show decided that they wanted me to be one of the first breakout gay characters on TV. Yeah. And she wasn't for that, yeah. And she said, not on my show, you don't. And she put her foot down until the very last day when we were shooting. Did I, tell you? I told you this. Anyway, the last day that we were shooting the scene, they bring on this woman that was going to be my gay lover. Right. I was so excited about being, you know, on the forefront of bringing gaydom into TV. Yeah. And, um, I knew that they had changed it. I knew the producers had changed the script because Jane put her foot down and said, no, you're not going to do that on my show. And, uh, but the woman that they brought in to play my love interest did not know that. So she got the old script of us or of her doing a shower scene and us doing a very sexual shower scene. I wasn't in there. She was in the, I was handing her the towel. And that's right. how the scene was written, but we were gay. We were in a relationship. And uh, so that, that morning she was hysterical. She was so nervous about playing this gay character. I don't know why there was a big deal. And uh, I was excited, uh, but I knew that they had changed it. So she was running around like a chicken with her head cut off. And I said, why are you so nervous? 
And she said, well, look what we have to do. And I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? So she hands me her script. She hadn't gotten the new script. <laughs> <laughs> and she hands it to me and she said, look. And I'm like, I thought it was hysterical. And I thought, should I tell everybody or should I keep it a secret? And I thought, if I don't tell anyone and we shoot the gay scene, then I'm at fault, right? Or am I? Yeah. And it's going to cost the production company hundreds of thousands of dollars to reshoot the whole thing. So I had to really give it some thought because I wanted the gay scene. Like a stupid idiot, I told the truth. Yeah. And, you know, the thing of it is, is that um, what I don't think Jane realized is that would have added so much to the show. Because, I mean, think about it. Like, um, that was something that, you know, I think sometimes people wanted to run away and, like, act like um, it didn't exist. But it did. And to try to ignore it and, you know, the, the, the prejudice behind it was so bad back then that, you know, they never realized just how great TV that would have been to do that because in oh, a lot of ways, once, you know, I, I remember like the TV show Soap did it with Billy Crystal's character yeah. and mm -hmm. it was tremendous. I mean, it was great. And it's a shame that Jane and it's a shame that the producers, you know, gave in because I really think that would have been a great storyline. I really do. Oh, Falcon Crest would have shot to number one easily. Yes. It would have yep. taken yep. over the the Dallas spot, it would have taken over everything. It would have been front page news, you yeah. know, and it would have done so much for my career. <laughs> yeah. It so really uh, I had a lot to wrestle with that, that day. You know, I did not want to tell anybody anything. I wanted to keep it a secret. Oh, it would have been so great. Yeah, it definitely would have. And you think about this too, uh, Jill, Friday nights, for, for the most part, if you, nowadays, and even more so in the 90s, if your show was on Friday nights, the chances of having good ratings didn't exist. But, good. but in the 80s, when you have Dukes of Hazard at 8 o'clock, you have Dallas at 9 o'clock, and then you have Falcon Crest at 10 o'clock. I mean, CBS, they put on some great TV, and they made, yeah. Friday, and they made a lot of people stay home on Friday nights because – Guess what? There was no DVRs back then. Nope. I mean, if you missed episode eight of Falcon Crest, you, you weren't going to see it again until the summer, maybe, if you were lucky. There's no streaming, no streaming at all. Yeah. So, I mean, I was in heaven and then I had a second series at the same time. Yeah. The new Gidget, which, you know, I, I had uh, Karen Richmond on yeah. the show not too I long love ago. Karen. And she's become a real good friend. And talk about just the not only a great actress, but an unbelievable person. I mean, yeah, she's it, can't get, it can't get any better than working with somebody like her because she is one of those yeah. selfless people in life. So we love I mean, each other. That had to be very rewarding to work with somebody like uh, Karen. Yeah. I just, I, I love Karen. I think that, you know, I mean, forever and ever and ever, I think that the two of us will be, you know, in love with each other. I, there was one time I beat her out of a part and the part was, it was, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, no, not exactly, but go ahead and let us, I'd love to hear about it. I was up for, we were both up for playing the mother of, um, um, the pianist. Um, come on. Oh, the pianist. Is that what you said? Yeah. 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 Who won the award for the pianist? Oh, come on. Help me out here. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, it'll, no. It'll come to me eventually. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um. Anyway, so we were both up for the role. It was a three-character short film. And Kevin Spacey was producing it. Right. <laughs> we shouldn't have. Okay. Um, and it was... Oh gosh, who helped me? Um anyway. Um so Karen and I were both reading for the role of his mother. And um 
and he chose me to play his mom. Wow. And uh, it was such a big deal. Help me. I just went up on. Well, you uh, know what it is? You know what it is, uh, Jill? I, I get so down on some of those award shows because I've seen people that should have won awards and didn't. That, yes. you know, ever since what they did to Susan Lucci over the years, those award oh. shows really turned me off a lot of them. So I wish I could be better help. But you know what? Like when it comes to that stuff, I've always felt like it's a little. Adrian Brody. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yep. Adrian Brody. So um, that was a big deal. Yeah. That was a really big deal. Three character movie, three character movie, short film. And I got to play the role of his mom. Yeah. And I mean, you beat out a great actress because I'm telling you that Karen is as underrated of an actress oh, I've ever Karen, seen. Karen and I were, it was just like, we just, the two of us were like this. Yeah. And, you know, and here's is that she, Is that like, does it make it bittersweet sometimes when you, that's somebody you're so close with and you have to beat them out to get this part? I don't think Karen. Well, I mean, everybody wanted that role. Yeah. I mean, come on. Everybody wanted to play Adrian Brody's mother. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I think she was. Yeah. I, I don't think just she was. Assuming she yeah. was, you know, um, you know, I just, I just love her. I mean, if we live closer together, I'm sure that we would be spending more time together. Right. But we don't live that close. You know, uh, Jill, one of the things besides acting that, uh, a lot of people, I, I mean, your close friends know about this, but, I, you know, I, I wonder if viewers know about this, but you have a real love for dogs. I mean, you've had many dogs your entire life. So talk about that a little bit because. um, Rescue you know, dogs. Yeah. Rescue. Yeah. They can't do it that. without us. Yeah. I told my dogs the other day, I have two, Benny and Kowalski. Yeah. Um, I've always had rescue dogs, except when I was married to my first husband, he wanted a purebred. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, but I I just love them. I and I think anybody I think anybody that has ever had a, you have a dog? I had one I had a black lab for sixteen years. He was the best dog ever. So And it broke people, your heart. Oh, I, yeah. No matter. I mean, he lived 16 years. So, I mean, that's a long time for a, a black lab to live. But I mean, they're like part of the family when you lose them. Not part. You feel it. They yeah. are. The yeah. Family. I mean, um, I I'm single now. And so through COVID, I'm in bed with Benny and Kowalski. And um, you're even more in love than before i mean you're lo you're in love the whole time with them and no matter what they go through if they get sick you're like uh, you know i mean you're you're worried to death yeah and the love the, the other day i told them that i would give up my life for them i said that to benny and kowalski and they and then i said whoa what am i talking about who's going to take care of you and yeah. then i took it back i said no i gotta live i gotta live yeah. Um, but that's the way I feel. And I think most people, and then people that have lost one say they don't want to go through it again. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so incredibly painful. It is. And I mean, you, let me tell you, um, <laughs> you go through all those stages to, uh, denial, anger, uh, acceptance. I mean, you go through them all. And, and, but the thing about dogs, Jill, is the reason you love them so much, never mind the fact that they're adorable, but they don't ever let you down. They, never. Give, you un they give you unconditional love. They never get you upset where, you know, you love your friends, you love your family, but there's times they could upset you. It's just yes. part of life. Dogs never do. They, every day you go home to a dog and even if you, even if like they uh, rip up a sneaker or do something, you're over it in 10 about minutes. it. Yeah. Yeah. Let it go. Although I was getting very angry at Kowalski um, because Kowalski has st um, stomach issues yeah. and uh, I've got him on medication now, but um, he had some major stomach issues and 
he was pooping in the house and he's too old for that, you know, and yeah. um, he's seven and pooping in the house. Uh, oh my God. It just, it was, it was a regular thing. And he was doing it on my rug, on my nice rug um, in the living room. And, oh, it was so nasty. But, and there were moments that I was like, oh, you yeah. know, and then, you let it go. And then you go, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to be mean to you. I love you so much. I'll do anything yeah. for you. And yeah. now we've got the stomach issues fixed. Oh, and good. I just, you please, people out there, please rescue, rescue babies. They need us. They can't do it by themselves. Please rescue doggies. Yeah, They're the yeah. greatest gift in the world. They're the greatest gift in the world. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. So, Jill, back to Falcon Crest. I mean, let me tell you, your character, and, uh, I'm, sure, like, and I'm sure you love playing that type of character where you can kind of, you crazy. know, be, be vindictive, do crazy things. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Angela's character met her match because, let me tell you, while uh, your character was... um going to do things and help her you were also not afraid to turn on her if, if be needed so i mean what a role it was nobody like expected jones, it you know aaron jones she she was one of the best villains in falcon crest and i mean she listen what she did to richard there nobody was safe and th like i said richard angela they had their moments of being bad on that show but they met their match when they met Aaron Jones. So what a great thrill that had to be to play that character. I was so sad when that was over. I was so sad because I thought it, it changed the whole nature of the show. Because the show was like, you know, let's get dressed up and be beauty queens. But, you know, when I came on, they let me be funny. And they let me be sexy and funny. And I don't know that they had a lot of funny on the show. Yeah. You know, I, I just don't know that they did. And I mean, just the scene, I wish people could see the scene, um, the scene where I'm in the courtroom and I'm lying to get Jane Wyman free. Yeah. And, um, and I'm, talking about how I knew about the hijacking of the wine because my cat told me, Lemuel, yeah. my cat, my trusted ally. And, you know, and the, they let me, I mean, the writers, the writers let me do really crazy shit. They didn't have anybody that was talking about having a trusted advisor as their cat, right? I'll tell you what I loved about that show too, Jill. You tell me if you agree or not. Just like the outside setting of it, it was oh, so beautiful. beautiful. I mean, on a Friday night at ten o'clock at night, and you're watching just like the the lighting outside and how beautiful it was. I mean, that's what to me really made. I mean, the actors obviously made the show. But yeah, the way they put the setting together was remarkable. Amazing, right? Yeah, to it be really... able to be on location in Napa Valley was pretty darn cool, right? I mean, yeah. you get to be on location and when you're not working, you go to the vineyards and you sample the wine. That's when I drank wine, but um, sampling the wine and the food, all the food, there was Michelin star, excellent food. And um, I mean, it was, it was like never, never land. And, and how, working with Jane Wyman. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and then you had other actors on there that, I mean, Lorenzo Lamas, he he uh, was making it big by then. David, obviously, was huge. David. I, and then you had, like, different people come on that show. I think I mentioned off here to you about Karen. Um, what was it? Karen Douglas. I yeah. mean, she was phenomenal in Superman. I mean, if you watched her in there, and then she comes on this show, she does a great job. You had Cesar Romero, who was <laughs> I mean, wow. you have so many people, but your character, you know, I think one of the craziest things I ever saw your character do was when she infected um, the vineyards with a parasite. Yeah, that was just insane. I mean, Crazy, I said to huh? my, 
you know, the what was funny right. was when you think about bad people like uh, J.R. Ewan and Angela, they were bad, but they never crossed the line to degrees of that. And your character did. So, I mean, you really were one of the top villains on that series. So that's, that's so a, sweet. Thank you. That's a credit to you as an actress. It was so much. It was so much fun. You know, I mean, the writers let me put mealy moths in the vineyards. They let yeah. me hijack. Yeah, I hijacked. I was driving this huge truck, hijacking wine. I'm like 103 pounds, and you know, and I'm hijacking wine, and I'm tangling with these big, you know, goomba guys, you know, and now I'm gonna hijack the wine now. And I mean, it was pretty crazy. I mean, it was such a, it was amazing. It was amazing. I mean. And then, you know, Star Treks and all yeah. these amazing shows. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I can remember, I think you were on at least two episodes of Who's the, Bo Who's the Boss. I remember at least one, but I think you might have been on there twice. I mean, you did so many things. And then you were on the, you know, you did one of the Freddy Nightmares, if I yes. remember correctly, which is always cool. Oh, with you know, and then who can, forget, who can forget? Mary the Crosby was my sister. Yeah. Yeah. Mary Crosby was my sister, and I was insane on that show. Yeah, and Mary um, Crosby. I guess when they, huh? Her character was famous for doing something special. It was talked about all summer. So I mean, you know. And then here we were playing sisters. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I killed her. I yeah. shot her. Um, but I also killed my parents on the show. Yeah. So, I mean, let me ask you, what do you like? I mean, obviously you've played good and bad. I mean, what do you like playing more? I mean, or do you just love working and it doesn't I really... love working. Yeah. I mean, I love working, you know, I, and, um, you know, it's very, uh, I, I might as well share it. It's so upsetting that nowadays you can't walk into a room and meet the writers yeah. And the director and the, you can't meet people and i think that that's why i was booking all these shows was i'd walk into a room and i would meet casting and director and writers and and i guess we you know they got a sense of who i was yeah and then they cast me nowadays i don't get to meet anybody um it's just after after covid i i really all i can do is hope and pray that we can get back to humanity and be people meeting people again you know instead of at a distance and not knowing they don't know who they're casting i mean they if you don't get to meet somebody yeah how do you how do you know what you're doing I mean, the shows I was on, I mean, Newhart, I got to hang out with Bob Newhart. You can't yeah. get much better than that. You know? And I always, I always ask this, Jill. I mean, when you're guest starring on a show, I mean, Falcon Crest was a long-term thing for at least two years. But when you're guest starring on a show and you might do one episode, maybe you'll get asked to come back for a second one. These people all know each other. They've been doing a show forever. Yes. So you've got to kind of come in and, it's almost like, um, I don't want to say eavesdrop on their show, but you come in and you kind of, you know, hang out for, you know, a week or two. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult sometimes when you're guest starring on a show? Yes. Because you don't know the cast and they know each other so well. Well, you're, you know, you're not really part of the family. So when you can kind of creep in and hang out a little bit more, like that's what happened on Newhart because I was a recurring character. And, um, you know, but the majority of the people on the show were so friendly. They were, I mean, Bob Newhart is yeah. at the helm and he's about as nice as you can get. And they always say Tom uh, Poston or Poston. Uh, Poston. He was a great guy, like very friendly. And I mean, very down to earth, you know, obviously I didn't know. Very friend. Yeah. But I mean, and then there was a uh, Julie Duffy. I mean, she was, you know, they say a lot of fun. So, I mean, it's always, I think it was, yeah, I think it makes a lot of people who are coming in. Larry, David, and Daryl, and Daryl. 
Oh, that was the best. I mean, that part, I think in a lot of ways that made the show successful too, because they whenever they into the gun and musket room, I was the waitress. Yeah. I mean, so you got to do things like that. You've gotten to work with so many uh, famous yeah. people over the years. And the way I see it, uh, Jill, if you weren't doing a good job, they never asked you to come back. The fact that Falcon Crest had you on there for a long-term commitment, New Heart brought you back, Star Trek, they wanted you back because, I mean, you know, you have to be able to be diverse as an actress. So it just goes to show that whatever they give you, as long as the writing is good, you'll, you'll do the other part fine. You'll act. Please, please. Yeah. Please. I just, I just want to do good work. I just want to, I just want to do good work. And if there's a little flair to it, if there's a little nutty flair, you know, I'll remember, I remember when Jane Wyman said to the producers, I like that Jill Jacobson. She knows her lines. And I was like, wow. Thank you. Okay, but one story, one Jane one, I think I told you this, but um, so one day we were getting ready to shoot a scene and one of the grips goes up to her and says, uh, Miss Wyman, phone call, you got a phone call. And she goes, oh, excuse me, um, Jill, Ronnie's on the phone. And I was like, Ronnie's on the phone. And she's excusing herself to me that she has to go get the phone because Ronnie's on the phone. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I mean, it's like I was a little kid. Oh, and she's yeah. she's telling me that Ronnie's on the phone. And, and the thing is, too, Jill, you know he was president back then because <laughs> you were on that show. He was the president. So, I mean, you've got the president of the United States calling. And, I mean pretty much you're working with an actress who was married to him at one time. I mean, it's almost surreal. It really is. Right. I mean, my first TV show, I worked with Brenda Vaccaro. Yeah. And I mean, I was a huge fan of hers. I mean, a couple of months later, I worked with Rock Hudson. I mean, whoa, these were like, I was like a little, I had to behave myself because you can't walk around being a fan, but my goodness, my goodness, you know, it was, there were movie stars then. Yeah. I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, the movie stars now are like if Brad Pitt would totally make my shoes come off. But I mean, wow, they were really like the old movie stars. Yeah. Jane Wyman was an Academy Award winning actress. And here I am studying film. And then my first starring role in a feature film was Blake Edwards' SOB. I didn't get to shoot it. Yeah. And that's another story. But I booked it. Yeah. And, you know, I always think about this, Jill, after watching your character, Aaron, on Falcon Crest. I think about how I would have loved to see you guest star in Dynasty and kind of be a rival to Alexis. That would have been something great because you would have gave, in some capacity, whatever character they gave you, it, that character would have gave Alexis a run for her money. Then I think about Nats Landon and if they had you oh. there, you could give the character Abby uh, Cunningham or Abby Fairgate. Uh, run for her money. So, I mean, I always think about the villains that they had on those shows and then you can come in and just kind of put them, you know, put them in their place. It would have been so much fun, but man, I mean, that, that run on Falcon Crest was one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, it's just, un- it's just unfortunate that they didn't keep your character long enough. I think they could have went until the rest of the series, honestly. Uh, it would have been, well, you know, they had, they, <laughs> They got rid of Earl Hamner. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, Which was a mistake. Big yeah. mistake. Yeah. Huge mistake. I freaking love, and I I'm, love Earl Hamner so much. You know, that show too, Jill, unlike Knott's Landing, Dynasty, Dallas, that show got rid of a lot of yeah, they know, sure did. main characters. I, I mean, know. You know, William Moses. Laura Johnson. Was, yeah. I mean, too many of the characters just left the show. And that really ruined it. You know, uh, Robert Foxworth, you know, 
it, it just didn't make sense to me. And it's amazing it survived a few more seasons. And yeah. a, lot, a lot of the reason is, is I think a, it was the guest stars they had on there, like yourself. I mean, that really kind of saved the show because they could come on and, you know, do different things. But it was a shame the way they, they went through cast members. Well, you know, it was the new producers that came in. Yeah. You know, they, they fired Earl. Earl was the creator of the show. Why would you do that? Yeah. Why would you fire Earl Hamner, the creator? It's kind of like, I don't know, you know? I mean, it's it's the new wave of people thinking they're going to save money or whatever. Yeah. They were already saving money with me. But, um, you know, Earl was the heart. I mean, not only was he the heart of Falcon Crest, but um, what was his show before? Um, oh, brain dead. Um, the the show, the Waltons. Oh, the Waltons. Yeah. Hello, yeah. So, Earl's the, the heart and soul of these shows, yeah. Why, yeah. Do you, why would you ever take the heart and soul away from a show that was? And we loved each other. I mean, I loved that man, I loved yeah. him. And he allowed me to flourish. I mean, when they wanted to kill me, he said, he, he made it that they didn't kill me. But then the new producers brought me back. And <laughs> do you know how they killed me? <laughs> they were getting all this fan mail. Yeah. Um, they were getting all this fan mail. And so the new producers didn't like that I was getting all this fan mail. Um, because I was off the show essentially. Yeah. And then they said, Jill needs to come back to the show and we need to kill her dead, dead. So nobody's asking for her again. Yeah. So they brought me back and they put me up against a firing squad. Yeah. They made me stand up in a room and they had a whole group of men with guns. Yeah. And it, and to and me, then I fell in David's arms and died. Yeah. And to me, that was a terrible way for your character to go out. It would, you know, if they wanted to kill your character off, that's one thing, but they kind of, it was just like, so matter of fact, it could have been better. How, yeah. they, you know, it could have been a lot better than, the way they did it was almost like, it's like you said, they wanted the viewers to know she ain't ever coming back. Right. That's, a, that's why they did it, yeah. you yeah. know, which was, and then, but I got to have one little jolly out of it. One little jolly. So I, I, I go dead. Okay. I'm dead in David's arms in David yeah. Selby's arms. And I had to wait for the director to call, call cut. Right. Yeah. And then I said, you know, dying is easy. Comedy is hard. Yeah. I got to get the line out. Right. Nobody heard it, but David. <laughs> you know what though? I mean, it, it's an it's a nice little ad lib right there. And let me ask you, Jill, um, you talked about this early on about Marie, how she wanted an hour to put your makeup on. I've never really asked any of the actors this, but it made me think about this as we were doing this interview. Is it annoying to have all that makeup on sometimes? I mean, is it, is it uncomfortable? I mean, how does it feel like when they're putting all that makeup on you? Well, when you love your makeup artist the way I loved Marie. Yeah. Um, nothing's annoying. You know what I mean? If you love somebody like you were talking about, you know, Karen Richmond, yeah. You know, we loved each other. We were in situations. That was the beginning of um, um, what was the. We weren't a network show. OK, so they they treated us like the step, the evil stepsister. Or the, yeah. You know, they didn't treat us the way you get treated on a upper crust Maybe. show. Yeah. We weren't treated that way. So there were many times that. We were having a rough time. You know, the actors were having a rough time. Yeah. So we would cling on to each other. Like, and it was so nice to actually love each other. You know, like Lily Hayden, 
who is a genius, by the yeah. way. Um, and she was the little LaRue. And her mom wasn't around all that much. Lotus Weinstock, another story, right? Lotus right. Weinstock. Um, that's another big story. But um, anyway, so we would hold each other tight because we were having a rough time. So when you're having a rough time on a show, you get even closer. So, you know, anytime I had to deal with anything, I would have Marie there. Right. You know, it's so comforting to be with people that you could trust and love. And I loved Marie. There's no right. way I couldn't love Marie. I mean, she'd always say, when you walk into a room, take in the room. You know, look around, do this, you know. I mean, yeah. little thing, little things, you know. Um, and those type of people don't get the recognition they deserve. No. Behind the scenes makes everything happen. Like I said, when you're looking at the beauty of Falcon Crest, I talked about the just the outside, how beautiful it looked and stuff. That's the camera work, great camera work. And then you've got so many other people who do, like even the, you know, the, the teachers that, you know, oh. are going over to stuff. I mean, it, 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 they're so invaluable. And I think sometimes people just forget. And that's why, like, I think it's important and people don't do this enough. And now the way they show the credits at the end is terrible. They show them so fast, but they yes. should always play those credits slow. And people should really pay attention to who the makeup artist is, who did the, uh, you know, the, the graphics, whatever, mm -hmm. the, because those people play make the show. They, yeah. They play just as an important role. Yeah. As the actors do. Well, we've got to bring the good old days back. Don't we? Yeah. Oh, I mean, fact, I've, said this, to... I've said this forever. When they got rid of theme songs, that really did it for me as far I as. No, because, because not having a theme song like, you know, I, I remember it started in the 90s. I would watch shows like Family Matters step by step. And then as they got to their six or seven season, they did away with the theme songs. I thought it was terrible. I mean, not having a theme song like Seinfeld for as good a show as mm. it was never had a theme song. I mean. It's just the theme song is where, to me, at least where I stand, gets the fan pumped up for the new season, for the whole year. You want to hear that theme song. It's yeah. A, yeah. I know. I just, I wish we could go, I wish we could go back in time just a wee bit to the humanity that we had before. You yeah. Know, just like go, walking into a room and meeting pe people. Yeah. Theme songs. Uh you because you never forget a show. You just never forget the people. You I remember sitting, we were, were having a break during Newhart. And um Bob was sitting by himself at one of the tables, just sitting by himself. And I just went and sat next to him. And I I just and I just said how do you know when it's funny? How do you know? Yeah. And he said, uh, well, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, well, <laughs> well, and I said, there you go. That's the answer. And that's, that was his comedy through the years it was mumbling. Yeah. And if you watch him, his mumbling was genius. He it really won, like, was every award there was, and it was all like a oh, well, uh, 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 and I started, I started doing a, I started copying him, because it was just like wow. I learned things from these people. Yeah, I'd like to continue. I'd really love to continue, and I'd love to be a teacher of those things. You know, right. just. You know, try and find, this is what I always told my stu my acting students was, um, no matter how dramatic the scene was that you've been given, find the humor. That's what Meryl Streep does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She always finds the humor in every dramatic scene there is. So when it hits you, it hits you so hard that you just burst into tears. Because you don't see it coming. Yeah. 
And that's what we need. I mean, that's what the world, the world needs it now too. Let's face it. Oh, definitely, definitely does. So um, let me ask you, Jill, what could fans like myself look forward to with Jill Jacob, Jacobson in the year 2024? I mean, we're already, you know, two months in, but what could we expect as we go? We forward? are already two months in. Okay. I did about three months ago, I did a stand up performance at the improv yeah. and um, I'm anxious to write another one and do another one. And I've got an agent in New York that is really plugging me and um, that is very anxious to watch this, to the, what we're doing today. And then I've got another agent in LA and who are also very excited about this podcast. And, um, you know, whatever they're going to give me, and hopefully it's good, we can, I want to meet the people. I would really love to meet the people that are doing it and create that kind of a family yeah. again, you know, because let's face it, I've been in these families that have been so rewarding. Yeah. I even worked on a show called Castle. Right. And um, and even though I was on it for just a day, it was it was crazy good. It was crazy fun. And it was like everybody in the room where we were working was it was like family just in that short time. I just want to feel that again. I would really like to feel that again. Yeah. That we can work and create something amazing that is dramatic and comedic at the same time. Well, you know what you need to do, Jill, when you get off uh, the air with me. You need to call Karen and you need to tell Karen because I'm saying okay. this, I'm saying this as a fan of both of yours who I enjoyed for years. You both need to get a podcast going to talk about your years. Oh, what a great new, idea. Doing the new Gidget. You need to review each episode. I'm talk a about the different. I'll call now. Yeah, you know, because I think that would be so much fun, and I think your fans would love that. So I really hope you two will give us something to that level down the road, because I think it would be great. Okay, I'll call Karen now. <laughs> yep, that's great. But yeah. Jill, I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes. To say it's a real honor for me, and I plan on having you back on the show. When, oh, I'd love to. Yeah, when yeah, I, I, love I, I would. I would love to have you and Karen on. I mean. Be yeah. so much fun, but you're a credit to the business. Like I said, you've been working for over 40 years. You've done a tremendous job. And like I said, you're one of the best TV Isn't villains. Isn't it amazing? I was working for 40 years and I'm only 27. Yeah. <laughs> hey. I just don't understand it. You know, but the yeah. way I see it, you're one of the best villains in TV history. And I really Thank applaud you for all the work you do. And just keep the keep up the great work because Every time, no matter what it is you do, you always entertain your fans, and we really do appreciate it. So thank you for giving me a Thank few you so much, Mike. You are so sweet. Thank you, Jill. It's a well, pleasure to be here. My pleasure as well. And folks, there you have it. That's the one and only Jill Jacobson. She is a credit to the industry. She's a remarkable human being, but a phenomenal and gifted actress. And I encourage everyone to check her out in 2024 because she never Everything's streaming. Yep. She doesn't disappoint us. She gives us a hundred percent all the time. And she's one of the most invaluable people in TV. So for in the spotlight, I'm Mike Kenichi. That was Jill Jacobson saying good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Jill.